The students at the Escuela Normal Rural Raul Asidros Burgos School in Ayotzinapa, Mexico, had an odd tradition. Every year they would commandeer local buses and take them to political events, returning them when they were done. Surprisingly, both authorities and the bus companies tolerated this, with the bus companies even instructing their drivers to stay with the bus in the event of a commandeering. But on September 26, 2014, that would change, as local authorities in the town of Iguala, with rumored connections to some shady groups, got word of the students' plans ahead of time and laid in wait for them. The end result was a night of chaos that saw six people dead and 43 students vanishing off the face of the earth after being forced into police vehicles. This is their story. If you enjoy true crime stories, please click subscribe below and make sure to set the notification bell to all to be notified every time I upload a new video. The students of the Ayotzinapa Bay School had every reason to think their plan would be successful that day. Steeped in a long history of political activism that produced many Mexican revolutionary leaders of the 20th century, the practice of taking over buses was practically a ritual for the students of the school. Bus companies even expected it, instituting policies and practices for their drivers when it happened. But what the students were unaware of as they gathered along a road in the town of Aguala in wait for passing buses that day was that local police there had been linked to a powerful drug gang by Mexican authorities. And while what exactly happened and why remains unclear, one thing isn't. Authorities were determined to stop the students by any means necessary. And when that became violence, they took every measure they could to eliminate witnesses in a bloody and violent cover-up. Surviving witnesses described the students as relaxed and happy as they awaited incoming buses on the outskirts of Iguala, having arrived in two buses they had previously commandeered. But that happiness would not last as local, state, and federal police, as well as the military, kept a close eye on and kept tabs on the students' movements. At 8.15 p.m., the students made their first move, swarming a bus that had stopped in front of a restaurant and taking it over. Having been instructed to not resist, the driver complied at first. However, he was not about to go down without a fight. He told the students he needed to make a stop at the bus station, and when he pulled in, locked them in the bus. The students began calling their peers on the other two buses, who arrived shortly thereafter, freed their classmates, and took over three more buses, totaling five with the two they had came in. As the convoy split up with three buses heading towards Iguala's northern beltway and two towards the southern, police were already in pursuit. Forces following one of the northbound buses fired warning shots into the air. The students were not deterred, ordering the driver to keep going as they dropped to the floor. Coming to a police car barricading them in the road, the students exited the bus and began throwing rocks at it. In the melee, a student even snuck up behind an approaching police officer and attempted to take his gun from him. This is when total carnage erupted. The other officers began shooting at the student. As he ran away, he was hit and lightly wounded by one of their ricocheting bullets. As the other students attempted to lift a police car blocking their escape path, officers opened fire on them too. Students hid behind the buses for cover. When the mayhem finally ended, one of the buses would contain 30 bullet holes. Student Aldo Gutierrez was struck in the head in the firefight. As his fellow students rushed to his aid, they too were shot at. One student was hit in the arm, another in the hand, shearing off several of his fingers. As he dropped to the ground, police kicked and punched him. Ambulance crews were allowed in, retrieving Aldo, the two shot students, and a fourth that had suffered a panic attack. Police ordered the remaining students hiding in the bus off of it and forced them into six or seven patrol cars. Meanwhile, the two southbound buses had also been stopped. After breaking the windows with tree branches and forcing the students off with tear gas, more students in the first southern bus were forced into police vehicles. 43 total students were taken from the two buses. None of them have been seen or heard from since. The second southbound bus had also been stopped, but the students, having received cell phone calls from the other buses and learned of the attacks, panicked and fled into the woods. But the students were not the only ones making phone calls. Authorities had alerted each other and were determined to prevent the other buses from getting out of the city. Othakari Gonzalez Augustine remembers the night well. 
He and his soccer team were on their way home from a game when they pulled up to what looked like a police checkpoint. Then they noticed a bullet-riddled cab sitting next to them. Before they even had time to think, officers began firing into the bus. The driver and one of Arthur Carey's teammates were killed. Minutes earlier, a woman in the cab had suffered the same fate. Ballistic tests would later show some of the weapons used in this attack belonged to the Iguala Municipal Police Department. A panel of experts would later conclude these attacks, quote, show a coordinated modus operandi to stop the flight of the buses. But the occupants of the taxi cab and soccer team bus would not be the night's last innocent victims. After the carnage had appeared to die down, the students on the second southbound bus began to emerge from the woods and record evidence of their attack, calling the students on the other buses. Word of what happened got around quickly, and within an hour, a makeshift news conference was taking place in the middle of the road, as teachers arrived to comfort the students and journalists to get the story. Around 12.45 a.m., two cars that had passed by 15 minutes earlier, carrying men with hoods and bulletproof vests, returned and opened fire on the news conference, killing two young men and injuring others. The terrified students again fled, this time into the city in hiding. When dawn came, the terrified students began to gather at the attorney general's offices and meet with authorities. But one student remained unaccounted for. Julio Cesar Mondragon had become separated from the group while fleeing the news conference. His body would be found later that morning, his facial skin and muscles torn off his head, his skull fractured in several places, and his internal organs ruptured. Many consider the incident a representation of the broken rule of law in Mexico. Authorities have been accused of stonewalling the investigation. A federal judge recently dismissed charges against 77 people who were implicated in the crime, claiming that widespread torture had been used to force their confessions. Mexico has 40,000 people registered as disappeared, making it a widespread problem often connected to the country's drug war. Surely the country is not alone in experiencing the horrors of loved ones apparently dropping off the face of the earth. But for 43 people to go missing at once while in the hands of authorities surely isn't commonplace in any country. And the parents of the 43 want answers. Many of them moved to Ayatzinapa in search of their children. The school opened to the parents in the first few years of the investigation, allowing them to move into its classrooms. Not every parent took the school up on that offer, and the reason why is heartbreaking. They have chosen to spend each night by their front doors, praying that one day their child will return home. Just what happened to the 43 missing students? No matter what the story is or what their ultimate fates were, the parents and loved ones of those missing deserve answers. We can only pray they will get them soon. If you've made it this far, thank you for listening, and please consider checking out some of the many other true crime videos on my channel. Please don't forget to both subscribe and click the notification bell so that you can be notified every time I upload a new video. I'm Jason Hebert, and I'll see you next time.